I came at a time when West Coast Leaf was rethinking its position in the women's community and what it brought to the women's community, um, how it could participate most effectively. We would invite women to join the organization or to join the board or to join a committee who were um, particularly members of visible minorities. My background is very unlike most of the women who were on that board at the time. Uh, my mother was an immigrant from Japan. My dad was a, a Japanese Canadian born in Canada who was interned in a prisoner of war camp in Ontario during the war. Um, I grew up with a lot of racism. I understood that and I didn't know how that would really fit in this organization because in many respects the organization to me had a just an image of being the other, the people who had the power or who had oppressed my family. We had the tools to take concerns to the court, but without the involvement of the affected women, it would be a very artificial voice. So we worked in partnership with gay and lesbian, the gay and lesbian community. We worked in partnership with the disability community. Um, and we would go to them and say, here is a case. Help us build the arguments. Help us reflect your reality as we present our case to the court. That's why I gave the organization a chance. I thought, well, you know, the intentions are, are there. The good intentions are there. And they're trying to, to implement them in a way that is meaningful. So I will help and do what I can. The attack on race was wonderful. It was probably the most growing part, point for LEAF, for me, anyhow. It's what makes this organization stronger. When we began to open ourselves up to other ways of thinking, other ways of doing, and other ways of interacting. In terms of the cases we took forward, we had a number going on. The first one that we took uh, to court was the NAME case, the NAME Act. Uh, which prohibited women from giving their surname to their children. And uh, we chose that specifically as a case that would uh, be taken across Canada at about the same time. It was one of those cases that we thought we could get a clear win. It was a good, strong um, affirmation of what we were looking for. One of the cases that we worked on that I found the most interesting was called uh, Brooks, Allen and Dixon in Canada Safeway. And that case concerned the entitlement of women to unemployment benefits for the period while they were away from work uh, for reasons related to childbearing. We set out to find that case because we wanted the Supreme Court of Canada to reconsider its decision from the 1970s. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada actually held that um, if, if women were not entitled to unemployment benefits during that period, um, it was because of a discrimination created by nature and not by the statute. Lynn Smith had argued the Stella Bliss case um, in the early years of her litigation career, and uh, she went back to the Supreme Court of Canada for relief then had the Bliss decision essentially overturned. And another was the Nordberg and Weinberg case um, that involved the issue of uh, a doctor his fiduciary relationship with his patient and trading medical services, um, sorry, trading drug prescriptions and medical services uh, for sex. Uh, it was a, a young woman uh, up in the interior, got a drug, uh, addicted to drugs, um, a prescription drug, and uh, this doctor kept her on the prescription drug, kept giving her prescriptions as long as she would sleep with him. The BC Supreme Court um, absolved the, the, the medical doctor on the grounds that she uh, herself had engaged in illegal conduct by um, being addicted to drugs and being involved in, in drugs. So therefore, she couldn't claim. We took that, that to the BC Court of Appeal and were successful, ultimately at the Supreme Court of Canada, in establishing boundaries in the medical relationship between a doctor and his or her patient. Um, a case that I was involved in involved Bishop O'Connor, who was convicted criminally of assaulting uh, women, First Nations women who had worked with him. The issue came up uh, in that case about the, uh, his access to therapeutic records 
of the victims he had assaulted. And he claimed, as part of his ability to make his defense in the criminal court, that he had the right to examine, without question, without condition, uh, their medical and therapeutic records. Lee stepped into that case because we saw a huge, a huge disadvantage for women if, when they move to press a, a charge of sexual assault, they know that their um, therapeutic records are going to be disclosed to the man who has assaulted them. It has a huge impact on their ability and their willingness to come forward. That case ultimately again went to the Supreme Court of Canada, and ultimately we were successful, not as complete as we wanted to, but putting in place a framework, um, uh, a checklist on what should be considered before those, those documents would be produced. Leaf has uh, always chosen litigation and intervention as the legal strategy, but we go to people now and talk about about lobbying as a strat legal strategy, about law reform, about international law as a strategy, not just our charter law, about other administrative tribunals, um, and about education. We um, started uh, uh, the No Means No uh, program. It was actually an idea that National Leaf National had uh, that we ran with out here on the West Coast. Uh, only our version was... Um, uh, quite different in implementation. The idea was to take the Ewanchuk decision um, of the Supreme Court of Canada, in which the court affirmed very clearly that no still meant no. There is no such thing as implied consent, um, because in the past people would be charged, men would be charged with sexual assault or rape, um, uh, and they could, they, their defense could be they, just, they assumed that there was consent there for whatever reason. And the Ewanchuk case actually involves a, a fellow who was interviewing um, and a young woman, a 17-year-old girl, came in for an interview um, and he sexually assaulted her. Um, and his defense, which succeeded at lower court levels, was that um, she was dressed provocatively um, and she never said actually said no. So, you know, it was fair for him to assume consent. Um, it turned out, in fact, she had said no a few times. And uh, we took that case to young people and trained uh, senior high school students to become facilitators with, uh, in, in, for groups of younger people. I believe it was grade 8. The results have been phenomenal. And uh, West Coast Leaf, uh, I can't remember the latest figures, but I know we were well over having reached 1,000 school children in this way with this message. And it was about um, not only no means no, but um, power issues and uh, gender issues, gender identity issues, uh, and really just giving these kids a place to ask those questions. If, for example, a male is given the label fag, then that can lead to violence and, it can, and people can have this idea that it's okay to say things and it can lead to these sort of negative actions. The, 